welcome to Listen Better. Today we are interviewing Kevin Green, who is the Chief People Officer at First Bus, so um, keeping us all moving in the UK. I would love to ask you, Kevin, first of all, can you paint a picture of the type of culture that you work in? Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons I'm here is that we're, the organisation is in a process of a major transformation. So if I was describing our culture, our legacy culture, where we've come from, very command and control, very top down. Um, the whole business has been focused on the asset, which is the bus and the timetable. And again, new leadership team have come in with a very clear agenda about creating an organization which is more people centric and focused on customer and customer service. So that's a huge shift. Um, and we're in the process of doing that. So the culture that we aspire to is one where uh, people are engaged, they're listened to, they can give their views and opinions, they're empowered to make decisions. And we've got a culture where people can be their true selves, where they can uh, come to work in, in an authentic way and be supported and developed so that they can give of their best. You've already started to answer my next question, which is around employee engagement. And you mentioned aspiring to having an engaged uh, team. So where do you start? You're coming in under, uh, with a process of transformation. I guess you're, you're starting with a certain... Yeah, well, you know, so the first thing is you have, to, you have to benchmark. And we looked at the historical data, but over the last year, and I suppose we're a year into a four to five year journey, and yeah, we've been measuring engagement on a quarterly basis. So every team, every depot, 60 depots in the UK, 14,000 people, uh, we're surveying the whole workforce every quarter to get data. And we're looking at uh, engagement as the sort of lead indicator. We're also looking at empowerment and we're also getting an emotional handle about how people feel about their job and the organisation. Um, and I suppose what I can see over those first three that we've done in the last year, we've got another one due in February, is that um, there's green shoots. We're starting to see some of the things that we are doing. We've put in a catch-up conversation, an informal conversation with every bus driver and engineer every sort of quarter, and, and that's starting to shift the dial. We've given free tea and coffee. So I can see four or five percentage import, uh, improvement points on engagement, empowerment, and how people feel about the organization. But it's a starting point. We've got a long, long way to go. We're also starting to measure customer and we're starting to look at the relationship and causation between improvements in some of our depots and with some of our teams uh, in relation to engagement and what that means in relation to customer. Because it's that, that power of those two metrics that I'm really, really interested that, you know, we, we're, we're keen to use the customer service profit chain as a model. So we treat our people right, we develop them, we grow them, we create the right approach, so they feel supported, they feel that they belong, they have meaning in their work. Uh, and if we do that right, then they will treat the customer more effectively and provide better service. Some of that's digital, but some of it's also about the experience on the bus. And if we get that right, customers come back, they travel more, they spend more money, they take more journeys, we make more money and provide a better community service because we're, a, you know, even though we're a private sector bus and, uh, business, we're still providing a, a public service. Okay, so the killer metric, if somebody who's not perhaps as advanced as this in measuring employee engagement, if someone to ask perhaps just a, a question a quarter, what do you think is the, the best question to be asking? Um, I think that the one I, well, there's a few, but the one I, I suppose I would normally hang on to is a sort of NPS question, which is, would you recommend this to a, would you recommend this as a place to work to a friend or family member? Because I think that gets you underneath a, quite a few issues. Um, I think there's also another, there's another one I always like, which is, uh, <laughs> have you had a conversation with your manager? Have you, you know, is there, is there regular dialogue? Is there regular information? Is there a regular exchange? So if you can get those two moving, I think you're sort of, you're, you're sort of moving in the right direction. Um, I'm a great fan of measurement, as you can imagine, at Question and Retain, that's our business. And, uh, and I'm really uh, fond of the idea of that virtuous circle that you create with a happy team, happy client. It's something I've always uh, approached working with in that way. So I'm delighted to hear First Bus is on that track. Um, you mentioned having informal conversations with bus drivers. I mean, you've got lots of different audiences within First Bus. So from presumably engineers right through to bus drivers. How do you 
divide all those channels? How do you communicate with such a diverse audience? Well, I, I mean, I think that's the whole thing. It's a very diverse and fragmented organisation. There's 60 depots across the UK and Ireland. We've got a big business in Ireland. Um, and it's very dependent on, you know, so we've tested it. You know, the one thing I would talk about is feedback loops. You know, it's not just about telling people stuff. It's about going around and, and listening. So I'm really into listening to what people have to say. And to do that, you have to create a two-way dialogue. So it's not just tell. Um, so we do a number of things. One is we do frontline manager sessions. So me and our, group, our divisional MD provide frontline manager sessions. We do every frontline manager every quarter. Uh, eight sessions across a week, which is fantastic. We do a little bit of comms at the front end. So everyone's about an hour and 15 minutes. We talk for 15 minutes, overview of what's going on in the organization. And then we ask questions and just listen. Where do they want to go? What do they want to talk about? Because if we can get them engaged, they're the people that engage the frontline engineers uh, and the frontline bus drivers, which are our two big populations. Um, so a lot of this is focused on those frontline managers. We've got an app that goes directly to uh, frontline colleagues, and that's where they get their schedules and the rosters. So a lot of communication that way, but lots of, again, feedback loops. So we get them to ask questions and to provide feedback. Um, obviously, the survey itself, which we're doing every quarter, but we're also trying to do these informal things, both those catch-up conversations. So when I arrived, we had something called job chats with frontline colleagues, all 9,000 bus drivers and 2,500 engineers. And it was a 14-page form. And surprisingly, it didn't get done very often. So what we've created is uh, something called a catch-up conversation. 20 minutes, your line manager, and it's about you. How are things with you? What's going on at home? How are you finding the job? And then questions about what we can change. How can we make things better for you? What should we do in this depot? Uh, how can we make life better for you? What we should be doing? And we get loads of really rich data and it brings the data that we get through the survey to life. So the thing that we're trying to now do is think about rosters and work-life balance and well-being for our bus drivers, because obviously there's a bit of shortage and we've been working very hard to bring new people in. But if, we're, if you've got a bit of a shortage, what you do is you ask your current workforce to work that much harder. So what we're trying to do is to unpick that, to make you know more part-time, more flexible schedules, attract different people to the organisation so that we're not just fishing in the same pool. But also we can start to provide schedules and rosters that meet people's personal uh, desires and their family life so that you know, they feel more in control and we're providing you know, a decent job, you know, supported, but they get the hours and the work when it suits them and what they want to do in their life. So that's a lot about shifting the experience of working at First Bus to something which is much more uh, focused on what they want rather than what we want. And that's the big shift. You know, we've designed this these jobs in the way that we've always done it. And we're now getting feedback that that doesn't work anymore. So we're having to adapt that pace. It's amazing. And it sounds a very labor intensive approach and the, the listening, uh, obviously, really, really important. And I'm so glad you then went on to talking about, well, then what do you do with all that rich of data um, and taking action? And it sounds like you're doing some some really innovative stuff to change the, the, whole, the, whole, the whole culture, as you started off by saying. So I see a lot of adverts around trying to attract, train and retain bus drivers. How do you, do? You, how do you do it at First Bus? Well, I think, you know, we've struggled like everybody else. So I think there's a couple of things to say. I think one of the things is, is we, the pandemic, uh, I think, had a huge cultural impact. Um, and what I mean by that, these people were working every day, our bus drivers and our engineers, our depots continue to function, very little furloughing, people work through it. Um, and they worked through it and they were often clapped on the streets. They were keeping key workers coming to work. 16 people died as a consequence of that because they were providing that service and got COVID and, 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 and obviously, um, you know, had, had the illnesses and then couldn't survive. And that had an impact on people. And also, I think what we then found is senior leadership disappeared. We were all working on Zoom and, and, and that created a, a little bit of a chasm. So it's suppressed. We've always had reasonably high turnover, sort of in the high teens. Um, when we went through COVID, it was obviously suppressed because we weren't running quite as many services and having to rely on public funding. Then we came out and again, the labour market exploded. People felt, you know, that they'd worked incredibly hard in a very tough environment and perhaps their leadership hadn't. So we have had to do a lot of work about retaining our people. And some of the things I've already talked about, the catch-ups, the, the engagement surveys, and training and empowering our line managers. Uh, we're doing a bottom-up change program called People Centricity. And all of that 
is in a response to try and make it a better place to work. And if people enjoy their job and we change their shift so they get more work-life balance and they feel supported, then our attention will will improve. And it, it's starting to, as I said, we're starting to see the fruits of our labour over the last year. What we also then need to do is to really think about how do we bring new people in? And we've had to think about our recruitment process, our EVP, and our promise to people, um, which historically, I suppose, has been very traditional. And we're now trying to make it a much more... Uh, flexible and you know employee centric offering you know in terms of how what benefits people get how we sell the job we've just done a bike scheme because you know we've got a zero carbon by 2035 objective you know our jobs to get people out of cars and you go to one of our depots and everyone drives to work because there's no buses that early in the morning so we've created a bike scheme so you know health well-being bit of nutrition get on the bike every day but also it helps us with a zero carbon and some of the stuff we're trying to do about attracting young people to work in our organization and to uh, continue to be uh, customers after they've gone to university or school so Yes, there's a lot going on in that space. And, and I think when you're doing a culture change, you need to have, you know, it's a multi-dimensional approach to it. You have to have a range of interventions while you're continuing to measure the trend and the impact they have. You mentioned the, the uh, pandemic, and I'm sorry for the losses that First Bus sustained there, and, and also a huge sense of gratitude to all those that kept everybody on the move and the key workers in particular being able to get to work. Um, so the pandemic for you, what, what did it teach you in terms of leadership? What were the highlights and lowlights? Well, you say? I, well, I think I think the lowlight was definitely what I said is that, you know, we had treated people as a bit of a cost and a commodity going into COVID. And obviously, when we came out of that, you know, everyone pulled together and there was a great team spirit. But once we'd sort of gone through the third or fourth lockdown and passengers started to come back and the, the, that feeling dissipated, I think there was left a feeling of, you know, lots of people asking those big questions. Is this where I want to work? Is this a great place? So, you know, the whole experiences. I think the pandemic gave people that opportunity to think differently about their lives. Um, and so we've had to respond. And, so, you know, so while some of this change and transformation program is about um, the strategy and how we deliver greater value for our customers, it's also about our people uh, and changing our view of them, you know, a cost and a commodity, into you know they are the focus of what we talk about and engagement's one of our four metrics that we measure every manager and every leader on so i think it's taught leaders a lot about the importance of putting people at the center of the business uh, and not taking them for granted so i think it was a big wake-up call uh, and i think we've responded and i think you know we measure ourselves in you know against our competitors and other people that employ people at 15 pound an hour and, you know, I think we're doing quite well over the last year. But you know what it's like. Changing a culture takes five years. You're not going to do it in one year or two years. So, uh, you know, I think we're, we're, on, we're on our way. We're making progress. Um, and I think the leaders are recognising that they need to behave uh, and spend more time thinking about and actioning people type of interventions. And if I could just dig a bit deeper and ask you to be even more candid speaking from your personal experience, Kevin, so pre and post pandemic, would you say that your approach to work and your philosophy on life as a whole has, has shifted? No, I'm not sure it has. I mean, I, I, so my, my, you know, I come, I'd sort of given up full-time work a few years ago, uh, written my book and gone off and done the non-exec plural thing. And I got attracted back to this organisation. I've always liked organisations, which I call sort of the earth organisations. I worked as a driver in the Royal Mail before people delivering letters. Now I'm working with bus drivers and engineers. And I, I love that um, because I, you can see what they do and, and they make a difference. And I, I'm passionate about public transport and the journey we're on because I think it's hugely important for our society and our economy. You know, if we're going to be zero carbon, then public transport's got to work. And buses are really important because they service people that are in the, the lower socioeconomic groups. So, you know, we help people get to school, get to hospital appointments, meet their neighbours, do things together, all, all of that. So, you know, it's the fabric of what, what makes a society and, a, and an economy work. So I'm passionate about what we do. And I think the challenge is huge. And I think what you do as you get older, you reflect on where you work best. And I work, I like being part of a team. Um, and we've got a great leadership team here. I like leading. Uh, I've been a chief exec before. I've been a, an MD. I've been a, a, an HR director. So I like to lead. So this is most probably my last gig. 
So I thought, why not? Why not go back and, and have one last hurrah and try and help this organisation shift from where it's been to where it wants to be? And, and that's, you know, it's exciting. I mean, there are days when it is really, really hard work. You know, it's two steps forward, one back every day. Um, and often it's, you know, I... I do a lot of self-reflection. I've, I've had a coach in my past. I, so I understand quite a lot about myself and I understand where I work best and, and where I don't. So I'm not sure it's the pandemic. It was most probably my point in life, I think, that's most probably got me to think about what I do from a work potential or work perspective. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so who have been the major influences in your life? You've mentioned a coach, which uh, completely applaud. But yeah, I've, I've, I've learned a lot from lots of different people. I mean, I, I, um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Churchill. Now, that's quite interesting because my politics and his are, are not quite the same. But I've read many uh, biographies and, and stuff. And I think it's, um, I think we have a weird view of leadership sometimes, you know, you you think about him coming to uh, becoming prime minister in 1940, you know, a few weeks from uh, Great Britain losing the war. Um, most probably the biggest leadership job of all time, you know, country in crisis. Um, and a man who, you know, had his demons, was an alcoholic, self-confessed alcoholic, had major problems with depression, called them his black dogs, but, you know, found a way of, galvanizing a nation you know so rhetoric communication painting a picture um created a cabinet you know uh, people from many different you know party of national unity so brought together people from you know clement Attlee on one side and eden on the other and brought them together as a team and started to go about you know recognizing how do we win a war when we're on a, the back foot and going backwards you know and i think that you know that's commendable and i think we have an i you know a very fuzzy picture of leadership sometimes leadership is really hard but you think about you know that biggest leadership job ever let's give it to the alcoholic with mental health problems you know that's my point i think that leadership comes in many shapes and sizes but what it's about is belief communication engagement with people um and it's about building teams and it's about creating belief that you can do things differently and i think you know there was a big lesson for me in Churchill, but, you know, I could talk about many MDs that I've worked with and many other HR directors that I've learned a lot from. So I'm a bit of a chameleon. I'm happy to learn and, and, and listen. I've had mentors, I've had coaches, um, and I think that's the way to go. You know, you, you can always improve. That's the point. You, you've never got it cracked. There's always ways and tools and, you know, insights about yourself and the impact that you have on others that you can you can get feedback on and learn and adapt and change. Fantastic. Do you have a favourite Churchillian quote? Oh, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm sure I could if I, I could even put on the voice and catch my, my lapels. <laughs> but no, I don't think we should do that. This time. Yeah, I'm not quite sure that's right. But I mean, you know, Martin Luther King's that, you know, that speech, I have a dream is something that I'm uh, hugely uh, was impressed. And I went to Washington not long ago and stood on that spot where he gave that speech. And you could just, you know, the hairs on the back of my neck went on end. So I'm a great believer in rhetoric and the ability to communicate and change people's minds and get them to see things differently. Fantastic. Well, it's been a great pleasure talking to you, but I just want you to wrap up and tell me what advice would you give your younger self if you could be transported back to being perhaps 18 years old? Um, yeah, I, I sort of got asked to leave school halfway through my A-levels. I was always meant to be going to university, but was really into sport. Um, and so, um, yeah, that was a bit of a thing. So I've done all my education later in life. So what I would be saying to an 18-year-old Kevin is mm, perhaps do a bit more learning, perhaps focus on the academic stuff and not, you know, focus quite so much on the sport because uh, that I've made my, lighter, my later life a little easier because I've done all my studying and getting qualifications while at work. Um, that would be one. And secondly, recognise it's all about the journey. You know, I've achieved lots of things in my career. And, and as I've achieved those things, they don't last very long. And so it's the hard work, it's the grind of getting there that's important. And you used to enjoy it uh, while you're on the journey rather than wait, you know, oh, it'd be brilliant when I make that speech or when I publish my book or when I've, I'm a CPO or when I'm an MD, it'll all be brilliant. Or when I retire, my life will be. In reality, I don't think that works. You've got to enjoy every day, enjoy the journey, enjoy the grind. It's the getting there that's important, the destination, you know, while it's important as a place to, uh, you know, aspire to, 
I think once you get there, the satisfaction dissipates. And if you look at Olympians and business people and entrepreneurs, you know, once they've achieved the gold medals or sold their business, they always go through that bump, you know, and I think that's because it's, it's the journey that's important, not the destination. Focus on the inputs, not the outcome. I love that rip-roaring, rousing finish to our chat today, <laughs> Kevin. And uh, I don't think diss your sporting career as a youngster, because that's obviously given you those people skills, which are playing such an important role as you're in, your, in your, um, your final job, as you've called it, as Chief People Officer. Thank you so, so much for your time. Absolute pleasure. Enjoy your team day you've got planned for the rest of the day today. Fantastic. I love the conversation and I'll uh, speak to you again soon.